It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, starring the inevitable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am, I am indubitably Andrew Bernstein, and you are John Hersey. So here we are for take two, John. A few technical difficulties the first time, but heroes overcome, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah, where would we be if they didn't? We've just got these little dinky yeah. problems to deal with. Little microphone yeah, exactly. issues, connection issues. And we largely get to rely yeah. on the geeks for this stuff. So, yeah. yeah that's right. It was over. That's right. So, we had tech. Yeah, right. You know, we, we did the show on Shackleton last week. And I think, you know, Shackleton's immortal line can be the light motif for, for our show and heroism everywhere. Obstacles are just things to be overcome, Shackleton said. And so, we do this take two. And if this does in if we if the technical difficulties persist, then we'll just reschedule for another day. But we're gonna the show must go on one one time or another, right? The show must go on. Yeah, we will yeah. Over, overcome this stuff one way or another. So, one of the greatest scientists in all of history, right? Charles Darwin, eighteen oh nine to eighteen eighty two, and Darwin, by the way, is uh, oh there he is, looks more like father. I was just. I was just remarking to our tech guys before John that you know he looks like more like an Old Testament patriarch than a nineteenth century scientist, doesn't he? He looks like like Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. But uh, like but anyhow, weird, yeah, yeah, uh, it's healthy, wholesome. But uh, today in the in the twenty first century, Darwin and one of our other immortal heroes, Aristotle. Are recognized as the two, you know, in, in biology, are recognized as the two greatest biologists of history. You know, the two geniuses who most advanced our knowledge of uh, of the life sciences. So we, we're, we're dealing with a real giant here today. He's, he is a giant. Absolutely, yeah. And and you know, we we're talking about before and uh, with with other heroes. Uh, common common trait among some of these heroes is that they're just they don't start out in life as great students a lot of them uh, don't really care for the classroom too much darwin's father said to him you care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching and you will be a disgrace to yourself and to all your family quite a prestigious wow. family name to live up to as you, wow as you know yeah. well thanks yeah yeah thanks dad right <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a, a number of points that come to mind here uh, with, with, with that remark, John. First of all, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, he comes out of two illustrious families, right? His father is, uh, uh, his, 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 his grandfather uh, was, uh, one of his grandfathers was Erasmus Darwin, and his other, his other grandfather was Josiah Wedgwood. You know, two charter members of the Lunar Society that we discussed you know, a, a, a month or so ago when we were discussing Joseph Priestley and the Lunar Society, these guys, I mean, Erasmus Darwin, a, 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 a top physician, a, a botanist, a writer, you know, an all-around an all uh, Renaissance man. And, of course, Josiah Wedgwood, the brilliant manufacturer of, pot of, of pottery and, and researcher in, 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 in that field. And so he comes out of two um, Ill illustrious families, right? His uh, father... Robert Darwin and his mother, uh, Susanna Wedgwood. He's connected to both of these great these great families. So yeah, he's got a he, he's got a family name to live up to. But also, you know, we were discussing before before the technology gave us uh, problems. A couple of points. I mean, first of all, what I, I think in general, what somebody does in their youth when they're a teenager or you know they're in college is not necessarily indicative of what the rest of their life is going to be like. Uh, you, know, you know, people very often emotionally mature as they get older, especially when they're working. Now, you know, school can be a lark, right? I mean, it can be a it can be a social activity for, for many people, but working is serious. I mean, you know, when you when you're working and you got to pay your own bills, you know, people tend to emotionally mature, and then they, I mean, when they grow up, then we, then we see what they're really made out of. And sometimes people who you know were, were, were rapscallions, you know, in their youth, turn out to do real serious work, great work. You know, in their in their mature years, as I was saying, some some of the some of the uh, the, the members of this show, you know, are in that are in that category. Of those they shall remain nameless. Uh, but it wasn't wasn't you, um, John. And then the other point was how you know how boring educators have often made education. Sometimes it's just 
real, it's terribly tedious, even when they're teaching academic subjects. And then the problem today in the American schools is they don't even teach academic subjects. So kids don't learn anything in this, and the classroom in, in one form or another is often boring. And uh, so I can understand why uh, Darwin, you know, a genius, a, a nascent genius like Darwin might have been bored in school, cared only for, you know, shooting and, and uh, writing. And, uh, um, and, and, and it, it leads uh, for us and the Hero Show to do a show in the future on, on Maria Montessori or some great educator and discuss how to revolutionize uh, cl classroom teaching. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of points there all wrapped up in, in, in Robert Darwin's uh, exhortations to his son, right? There's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of different points to be made there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Darwin's preferred classroom was not uh, there inside, but out in the woods. He you know, just from a very young age loved to collect different specimens of, of uh, animal, plant, minerals. So he, he was already very interested in nature at a young age and, and not very interested in learning from books. It wasn't that he was uh, stupid by any means. He was brilliant, really. And uh, that was to come out later in life. You know, uh, he did have the benefit of going to some pretty good educational facilities, right, Andy? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he sure he sure did. University of Edinburgh Medical School was was the leading medical school probably in the world during the during the in the eighteenth century Enlightenment. You know, in the in the in the century preceding Darwin, and I have a whole section in the Capitalist Manifesto on on how the University of Edinburgh Medical School was. Um, uh, was the cradle of the Scottish Enlightenment and and of and of the Industrial Revolution. One thing, and, and, and now now Darwin <laughs> found out very quickly medicine was of him, and I'll leave it I'll leave it to you in just a minute to tell that that, that story. But uh, Edinburgh, for one thing, unlike you know, what they call Oxbridge, you know Ox Oxford and Cambridge were open during the Enlightenment, you know, just before Darwin's day, uh, and, and maybe during Darwin's day too. I'm not sure. But they were open only to uh, Anglicans, you know, only the, you know, no, no, no nonconformists could, could go there. So all, the best minds amongst all these other Protestant denominations, uh, you know, couldn't, couldn't, go to, couldn't go to those schools. But they could go to Edinburgh. Edinburgh was, was, was open to, to, you know, all different religious denominations, certainly all, all Protestants. I'm not sure how open they were to Catholics, never mind, <laughs> never mind Jews. But uh, that's actually that's nothing funny about that. But um, they were certainly open to all different Protestant denominations, so they got top minds, you know, from, from all all these different uh, groups. And secondly, they focused at Edinburgh. They focused on, on observation, on empirical based research. They thought not not just what did the, what did the authorities say, you know, on these issues, but they they focus on observable facts, you know, and using you know Newtonian uh, methods. So Edinburgh uh, Medical School was a uh, was a leading, you know, truly a, an outstanding center of of higher education and uh yeah charles darwin went went there for, for at least a while but what happened when he what happened when, when he was there john when he was studying medicine yeah i mean he quickly found out that blood made him squeamish uh he was in an operation at some point and it was just terrifying to him he left and never stepped foot in an operating room again but he loved his classes on natural history he met a, a guy named robert grant a lecturer there who took him on excursions to find different species, catalog different species from tidal pools. So he was there for a couple of years and uh, it was clear that medicine wasn't in his future. So he left without a degree and he went on to Cambridge. His dad was very adamant about him having some sort of respectable career. Well, it wasn't going to be in medicine. He thought, well, maybe you should become a, a country parson, a priest of some sort. And so he said, all you need is to go get this degree at uh, Cambridge and Young Charles Darwin obliged, went to Cambridge again. He wasn't really interested in the topics that he was there to study. He was very interested in science. He was there to, you know, to get this education in divinity, but he took all sorts of classes in natural science and botany and geology. And he was mentored by some very, very great minds in the field. Uh, Adam Sedgwick, a geologist at Cambridge, was uh, president or be quickly became president of the Geological Society of London, a uh, mentor to Darwin, as was. John Henslow. And Henslow, a botany professor, uh, really saw Darwin as this up-and-coming uh, great scientist. And when he got called 
to take the position as the unpaid naturalist aboard the HMS Beagle. Uh, his wife, you know, he, he was married. His wife didn't think him being gone for several years was such a great idea. And so he gave, uh, he gave Darwin a call. Not really. He sent him a letter and, and sent Captain Fitzroy a letter and said, hey, you know, I think Darwin's your man. And uh, Darwin took him up on it. You know, at first he wasn't sure that he wanted to be, to be so far from home and for so long. It's projected to take two years on this mission to chart the coast of South America. It ended up taking a lot longer. But uh, Darwin yeah. really changed on this journey. You know, he left this sort of undisciplined softy and came back a, a hardy adventurer. It's just this incredible story of Darwin on the HMS Beagle, right, Andy? Yeah, the first first of all, one a couple of points, John. First of all, the poor guy <laughs> turned out to be prone to seasickness. So, you know, the, the, yeah. on a voyage that lasted almost five years, that's uh, really un unfortunate. But, you know, the, the whole theme of our show is heroes overcome. Our obstacles are just things to be overcome. And despite frequent bouts of seasickness, Darwin wrote up his notes you know, his journals, um, you know, and, and uh, his findings and, and sent them back, sent them back to Britain while the journey continued and scientists back home had access to his, his research. And, you know, and, and um, by the time Darwin got home after almost five years, he was something of a, of a celebrity in, um, you know, in, uh, as, in, in scientific circles. So, but I could relate to that because I was, you know, a seasick, my dad had a boat when I was a kid and we used to go out in the ocean on it. Ah, you know, I don't suffer from other forms of motion sickness, but you know, that up and down uh, constant on the waves. It's just, I was seasick all the time. It's a miserable experience. So I get, we, I want to salute Charles Darwin that he overcame this chronic misery, you know, uh, to, to get all his notes and journals uh, written up. But yeah, so, um, scientists is often, when you're doing field research, it, it can often be dangerous. You know, it's not for the, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. You're, you're in the, you know, and Darwin was in, you know, jungle, you know, jungle areas and there's, you know, there's disease bearing insects and there's, you know, dangerous animals, venomous snakes, you know, dangerous animals like, you know, jaguars, you know, and, and stuff like that. And somebody who's, uh, you know, uh, fate of heart. This is, you know, field research and science is often, uh, it can be dangerous. I think, as I vaguely remember, this year, I think, we, we can Google this, but I think there was a geologist or, or glaciologist who just died, like, like in, two, in 2020, I think, you know, researching the glaciers in, in, in Greenland. I think, I think it was, a, it, it was, it was just this year. So, you know, field research can often be dangerous. And you're right, Darwin, Darwin came alive you know, in these, in, in these sometimes dangerous settings because, you know, it, it, he realized, I mean, like you said, he was always a naturalist. He always had a fascination for the woods and, and for nature, but he realized this, this is my calling. You know, this is what, this is what I want to do. This is what I was meant to do. And, and uh, danger, if there's, if there's dangers, well, I'm just, I'm just going to face them in the name of science, you know, scientific research and, and the attainment of knowledge. So again, very heroic on the part of Darwin and a number of other scientists who do, you know, who do uh, field research like that. Yeah, he was a serious, a serious novice and he really didn't know what he was getting himself into. Uh, you know, you mentioned seasickness. He also just he was sort of a softy. And uh, he said his notions of the inside of a ship were about as indefinite as those of some men on the inside of man, a large cavity containing air, water, and food mingled in hopeless confusion. But yeah, over the course of nearly five years, you know, he got to South America, uh, where they spent most of their time, and it was just this naturalist's paradise for all these places that had never been explored by a naturalist, never, uh, you know, never cataloged, species never understood, and you know, he'd, he'd go to land for months at a time, uh, just by himself with with some of the gauchos, some of the, uh, the South American cowboys. And yeah, he'd be in the woods. There, you know, jaguars, all sorts of poisonous insects, uh, piranhas. Could have very easily uh, died there, but he came alive, like you said. He became this hardy, adventuring scientist, and he rose to this Herculean task. You know, unlike school, this was this was something really, really intriguing, really motivating, 
and uh, he, he came alive. There was this uh, a great talk on this topic uh, Isaac Morehouse gave at Toscon, and uh, it's called How to Find a How to Create a Career That Makes You Come Alive. And I think that you know Darwin found his his calling here. He, he created it in a sense by just stepping up to the task, realizing okay, there there are all these different species that need to be cataloged. There, there's all this knowledge here at my fingertips, and all I've got to do is is learn how to organize it and learn how to turn it into useful knowledge that, uh, that you know I can write about and send these species back home. So, you know, crate after crate, he, he found just so many new species, so many specimens he didn't really know at first what he was doing. And so he had to figure out how, how can I sort of strike a balance here, not send back too much, you know. So he had to study hard. He, he read several books on, on the journey and uh, continued to learn about biology and geology and ended up with uh, thousands of pages of notes, a thousand, a thousand plus specimens uh, in spirits, 4, 000, uh, around 4,000 skins and bones and other specimens, and uh, a live baby tortoise, which is pretty interesting. He went home with one of those. <laughs> the tortoise made the made the trip right for you went back to went back to the uk i'm sure you appreciated darwin shipping across the world to, to a whole whole new environment but <laughs> but you know i want to you know speaking of the adventurous life of of many scientists doing field research i'm a literary guy so let me put in a you know a literature plug here uh another great british thinker sir arthur conan doyle who was uh a, a later contemporary of Darwin, right? I think I think uh, Doyle was born, if I remember correctly, late 1850s. Darwin dies in 1882, and um, and he's writing the Sherlock Holmes, the great Sherlock Holmes stories, brilliant Sherlock Holmes stories, my favorite detective of all time, many people's. Uh, you know, he's writing, you know, turn of the 20th century, and a lot of the a lot of the Holmes stories are set in London and various places in in England in the 1880s. You know, you know, just right around the time when uh, you know of, of Darwin's death. But anyhow, um, Conan Doyle. Yeah, you mentioned to me before, John. I'd forgotten. Conan Doyle went to the University of Edinburgh Medical School, graduated, and was a physician. But that w wasn't his calling. Obviously, like being a novelist was what was what he loved, and he's immortal and and properly so for the Sherlock Holmes uh, creation and stories. But he created another character. Uh, who's also fascinating, Professor Challenger, who's a scientist. <laughs> and he wrote a series of stories and books about Professor Challenger. Unfortunately, they're not as famous, uh, but you know, they deserve to be. Challenger was a, was a zoologist, was a brilliant scientist. Uh, and, 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 and Conan Doyle had this penchant for fascinating characters. You know, Sherlock Holmes, of course, is inimitable. And Challenger is distinctive in his own way. He's a brilliant guy. But he's pugnacious. He's belligerent. You know, he's always ready. He's always ready to you know, take on an intellectual battle with somebody. He's a physical. He's built like a gorilla. You know, he's not. He's not tall, but he's like, you know, he's just a powerful guy. And and um, anyhow, the 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 point I want to hear is one of the Professor Challenger novels, The Lost World, is set way back in the Amazon. You know, this is turn of the twentieth century when there was parts of the hundred more than a hundred years ago. When the parts of the Amazon were still unexplored, I mean, it's a vast, it's a vast region, and it was still, uh, you know, unexplored at least by you know Europeans and 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 scientists and everything. And so the story is that there's a plateau, you know, you know, deep in the Amazon rainforest or jungle that um, where prehistoric life has survived for various reasons. And Professor Challenger leads a party to go ex ex explore. This brings up some scientists from from England who disbelieve his his thesis. And of course, it's really dangerous. I mean, they're attacked by pterodactyls and, there's, and these, these large carnivores. I don't think Tyrannosaurus rex was there, but there are other similar you know, large carnivores and, and, other, and other dangerous creatures that I won't mention. It would be a surprise you know, to read the book. The, 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 the title is, is The Lost World. Anyhow, um, this is super dangerous, you know, more dangerous than what Darwin's facing. But still, it's the same, it's the same principle. Challenge is willing to, Professor Challenge is willing to face all these dangers, you know, uh, uh, in order to advance scientific knowledge. I mean, he's fascinated by it. It's his calling. He's willing to risk his life. And, and many scientists have, have, done, have done that, Darwin included. Some of them have lost 
their lives doing this dangerous field research in different, you know, in, in, in different venues. And fortunately for Darwin himself and for the rest of us, he survived some of the perils in his, in his jungle, you know, environment where he, he was researching, made it back to, to the UK. And as they say, the rest is history, isn't it? Because uh, uh, like we said at the outset, he's one of the two greatest biologists of history. Yeah, he went there and he struggled to survive and he witnessed a struggle for survival. One of the things he saw was these just like hundred yard columns of, of ants just eating everything in their path. And he had read uh, Thomas Malthus, I think uh, that was probably after his voyage, I don't remember the timeline now. But, you know, he, he was seeing this development of life and this sort of struggle to survive. And uh, on a beach some uh, roughly 400 miles south of Buenos Aires, he saw this white streak in the rock and was very interested in, in geology. He considered himself first and foremost a geologist for you know, the, the first part of his life. And so he went up and, and checked it out and started digging this out and found the fossil remains of this just very strange creature that had since gone extinct. And he started to come to the realization that life was in constant flux and development. That it wasn't the case, as so many people believe, that these species were created once and for all by God, that they were uh, you know, just these immutable, unrelated species. Uh, in fact, Captain Fitzroy of the HMS Beagle wanted Darwin to, to go out and find evidence of Genesis and the biblical flood. Of course, is not, but Darwin found it all. He followed the evidence where it led, and, and where it led him was to this new idea, you know, there are other theorists had, had posited this idea of, of evolution, but they had posited it. They really hadn't gone through this massive process of induction that Darwin did to come to his conclusions. And that's why his conclusions are so certain. You know, uh, later in, in the journey, really on the return trip, they stopped at the Galapagos Islands and the uh, anniversary of that is next week. That's what we're uh, here to celebrate today. Darwin's landing at the Galapagos. And, uh, you know, in just the first island, he found 26 species of birds that he'd, he'd never heard of before. You know, he'd done plenty of research by this point. Uh, species he also found varied from island to island. Certain finches on one island had different beaks than those on another. And he, he you know, he intuited that their beaks were better uh, used for, for different types of food. So, you know, he started to realize that there's just this development of life, this just struggle for survival. And uh, it wasn't until later that he would sort of come to this idea of selection. But uh, he took these findings back with him and, and really he, he did years and years and years more of, of studying to come to his, his conclusions about evolution. It wasn't as if he you know, he saw a few things, put a few things together and said, okay, I've got this theory and I think it's true. Now he considered it a theory for a very, very long time, decades, in fact. Uh, and, um, you know, he, once he got back, his, his uh, obligations were tied to the Beagle journey. He had to catalog and disseminate the information that uh, on geology and, and zoology. And uh, evolution wasn't his, his you know, his assigned project. So it got backburnered, but uh, he also put a ton of, of thought and time to it on the side. And, uh, you know, in time, in, in 1859, as we'll talk about, went on to uh, publish The Origin of Species. Right. And um, it's, it, I, let me, I want to say one thing before we get to Origin of Species and evolution and, 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 and natural selection. As a philosopher, I should say one thing. Uh, the whole 19th century, theoretically, is evolution happened. Uh, evolution is a major concept in 19th century intellectual history, you know, uh, before Darwin published his Origin of Species. And the progenitor of, uh, uh, of this theory is Hegel, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, the uh, German philosopher, whose dates were 1770 to 1831. Uh, I, I'm not an admirer of Hegel. I got. I want to be very honest. In fact, I loathe. In fact, I loathe Hegel. Not just for his his collectivist politics, uh, but for, but for his impenetrable writing. <laughs> you know, I would. Uh, I don't wish having to read Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit on anybody. But let's say, you know, 
uh, communists, Nazis, and jihadists. You know, you know, mass murders. Yeah, make it read that book. There's this cruel and unusual punishment, and I have to make sense out of it. But anyhow, anyhow, uh, Hegel uh, had this this very speculative theory that reality itself is evolving. You know, that, that, and, and it's not just in motion, but it's in motion from a, a lower form of development to a higher form of, of development. Reality itself, reality as such is evolving, not devolving. And so there's the, you know, th that, that theory was widely studied by Western intellectuals during the, during the 19th century. And there's a, there's a philosophic framework amongst educated people in the Western world that makes them amenable to Darwin's distinctively biological version of, uh, of the theory of evolution. And uh, we, we point out, as you, you were pointing out, John, unlike Hegel's theory, which is entirely speculative, and, and, and you know, Hegel's somebody who, like, if he avoided induction or, you know, deriving principles from observable facts, as though, as though he thought, you know, observation would, from, from observation, he would he would derive some horrible disease, you know. Was uh, where by contrast, Darwin's theory, specifically the distinctively biological version of evolution, is inductively uh, generated and supported by a plethora, by a wealth of of observational uh, facts and, and and evidence. So anyway, I just want to, but 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 educated people are already familiar with the broad framework of. Of evolution, which is why there was a there was a receptive audience amongst scientists and other intellectuals for for, for Darwin's uh, distinctively biological version of evolution. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right to draw that distinction in in terms of different theories of evolution. There were even a few theories of biological evolution that preceded Darwin. In fact, his grandfather, who you mentioned earlier, Erasmus Darwin, published a book called Zoonomia in the 1790s in which he gave a sort of vague indication of a theory of evolution. Uh, there was also Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and Lamarck had also, uh, it also had his own theory of evolution, and in fact, Darwin credits him for sort of pointing the way in Origin of Species. But Lamarck had a more simplistic notion of how traits are passed down. And Darwin, you know, he sort of saw through that. Lamarck thought, well, you know, a giraffe, for instance, stretches his neck to get to the leaf, and then its its babies will do the same. The necks will get longer and longer over time, and that's not really the the natural selection theory. There's you know, some some key differences. Um, you know, many many things that Darwin observed you know, went into this theory. He saw, you know, for instance, why is it that that males have nipples? They don't need nipples. Why is it that certain types of beetles have these wings that are encased in impenetrable shells, like they, they can't use these wings? Uh, why is it that, you know, there's this constant flux of species? If God created all these species once and for all and put them where he wanted them, then, you know, why is it that there's this flux? This doesn't really make any sense. Uh, he did tons of experiments. People don't really think of Darwin as an experimentalist, but you know, for instance, people said that you know it was impossible for seeds of one plant to travel hundreds of miles to an island and germinate there because seeds would become uh, that you know they would they would die in salt water. So you know, Darwin actually tested this out. He, he put seeds in salt water, uh, you know, close to a month or something, and then and then take them out, and they would still germinate. So he, he disproved that. Uh, he actually put some of these seeds in, in dead fish and fed them to birds and uh, <laughs> hung out and wait for, waited for the birds to poop. And then he'd go, it's pretty, pretty hilarious, he'd go in and find it and uh, plant those seeds and they'd grow too. So he was putting, to piece, putting these pieces together into a, a theory that showed how, wow. uh, how it was possible that you know, this process of selection could take place. Now, another key part of that we should mention is his interest in domestic breeding. Once he got back to England, it wasn't as if, like we said, it wasn't as if this theory was a, a solid done deal. He started speaking with breeders of pigeons and pigs and, and sheep, uh, you know, looking into the, the uh, cultivation of wheat and potatoes. 
and, and saw that people could select the best and uh, choose that to, to carry on. So from there, it wasn't too far of a leap to go from, from this sort of man-made selection to a process of natural selection, especially when he had seen this sort of struggle for life out and about in, in various places on his journey. So yeah, yeah you're actually John... right. The process of induction that, that led him to the, the theory of evolution. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you, while you were speaking, it occurred to me, you know, we're talking about, you know, waiting for the birds to eliminate, and then you're going to go going through the, the fecal matter. I was thinking, ah, the things you got to do to be a, a scientist, you know, to be a field researcher. I think I'm going to stick to being a writer and, a, you know, a philosopher. It's, like, it's, a, it's a lot cleaner, a lot cleaner life. But, yeah, I mean, again, when it's your Absolutely. calling, yeah, that's right. When it's your calling, this is, this is what you do. And it's fascinating, you know, since Darwin was, sending back to England over this, over this almost five-year journey, you know, his, his, his findings, his re research and journals and, and stuff. You know, some of it was published by uh, his former uh, professor, was, I think it was Henslow, right? Published, published yep. it. And there, there was, there was, there was a, a receptive audience for what, for what Darwin well, you know, was saying. He gets back, was that, well, the journey was, I think, was 18... Late 1831 to sometime in 1836, so that, that's 23. He returns. He's still it's still 23 years before you know the publication of Origin of Species in 1859. So there's you know there's a lot of work for him to do, but it's it, he had a lot of support from uh, scientists, which is 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 really good to see. Um, you know because you know, we 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 know from being big uh, admirers of Ayn Rand, you know, reading The Fountainhead. How often innovative thinkers or revolutionary thinkers are opposed, you know, in their own day. And Darwin certainly had, had some opposition from fundamental. But uh, uh, you know, we discussed Pasteur recently. We know he was one of those examples. They wanted to put him in an institution. <laughs> the French medical establishment wanted to institutionalize him for the you know the germ theory of disease. And so Ayn Rand's thesis in the Fountainhead, unfortunately, is very often. True, whether it's Socrates or Galileo or Copernicus or, or Pasteur, very often, or Ayn Rand herself, we could say, very often these revolutionary thinkers are, are opposed and they could be burned at the stake by the church or beheaded by the Islamists or, you know, murdered by the Nazis or communists. But um, uh, Darwin, although you know, famous for the later conflict with, with religious fundamentalists, especially in the United States, there was a lot of scientific support uh, for Darwin in his day, and it's it's good to see that sometimes somebody can can develop a new theory, and and there's actually other minds in society who uh, who who welcome it. Although you know, in the Fountainhead, Ayn Rand shows us you know Howard Rock has support, right? There's Gail Winand and Dominique Franken and Steve Mallory, and there's all kinds of you know Roger Enright and Kent Lansing. There's all kinds of supporters. But generally, society was you know was opposed to him, and uh, uh, Darwin has Darwin has a lot of support amongst the scientists of his day. You know, they, you know some of them disagreed with him on this, that, the other thing, but they encouraged him to to do this work. I mean, he was, uh, his career was largely you know in those years as a geologist, but at the same time, he was developing his thinking in the you know in, in the field, in the, the evolutionary theory in the field of biology and. Yeah, we both of us want to keep stressing, inductively, inductively arrived at, supported by a plethora of observational evidence. So, so this is yeah, you know, this is this is great science, and it's great to see other scientists supporting it during his lifetime. Yeah, I mean, this is a huge, huge advance, and and people are still in the creationist myth. You know, they still think that the Earth was created in seven days, and that God created. All these species that they are immutable that there's no relation between species for the most part and and even uh you know you mentioned he was a geologist first and foremost well he was taught by uh cedric who we mentioned earlier at cambridge and Sedgwick, when he read origins of the species he was a he was a minister i believe he said this book seems to shut the door on any view however feeble of the god of nature as manifested in his works from first to last it is a dish of rank materialism, cleverly cooked up and served up. So there were some, even in the scientific community, there were some uh, naysayers, but 
within a decade, most people in England had accepted, it was a widely accepted theory. I, I, wanna, I don't wanna say most people because I don't know that it was most people, but many did. And you know, fast forward, I think you pointed this out earlier, fast forward to uh, 1925 in America and we're, we're having a scopes monkey trial about whether or not evolution can be taught in schools. Isn't that just crazy? Took so much longer yeah, for it to take root. It's disheartening, you know, that that in the United States, which was which was a land of of of, pro, of so much progress and so so much forward thinking in so many fields, that you know that evolution could be banned from uh, from the high school biology curriculum in a, in, a, in a number of, of of Bible Belt states. But maybe we should we should do this uh, chronologically. So uh, we yeah we you know, get there. So yeah, you know the theory. The theory is certainly opposed by fundamentalists, and we should be, you know, be clear what that means right, by people who take a literal interpretation of the Bible. You know, well, anywhere in the world, if you're a fundamentalist, you're, you're not going to be able to accept evolution because you know, the, if, if the Bible is to be taken literally, then when, the, you know, when Genesis tells us you know, that God created human beings in a day, then a day means a literal 24-hour period. The amount of time it takes the Earth to rotate once on its axis. Um, whereas, you know, in the theory of evolution, <laughs> by the time you get to human beings, the evolutionary process, I, I think, it's been, going, it's been going on for billions of years, I think, since, you know, my, my knowledge of biology is limited. But I think, you know, the, 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 the amoeba or the single cell organisms, I believe, are, you know, roughly three billion years old. And so, you know, you get, you get the development, the evolution, the forward motion from less sophisticated life forms to more sophisticated life forms over literally billions of years. It's not a day. So if you're a fundamentalist, you can't accept Darwin, Darwin's theory. But what you said, uh, John, is, is true. Amongst educated people in the UK and certainly amongst the scientific community, Darwin's theory was well, widely accepted. Uh, early on, uh, another great scientist, uh, Alfred Russell uh, Wallace, you know, had arrived at similar conclusions independently, and I think they, I think they, co they, they, they published a paper, you know, right before in 1850s, right before Origin of Species, they published a paper jointly, you know, on 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 this theory. And of course, one last point before I turn it back to you, John, uh, we mentioned when we were discussing discussing William Wilberforce and. Um, the battle for his his relentless battle to abolish first the slave trade and then uh, slavery itself, for, for which we salute, you know, uh, Will Beforce. And he was a real hero. But of course, he was a he was a bishop. He was a highly religious guy in the Society for the Suppression of Vice or whatever, whatever that horrible society was that we discussed as one of the downsides. His son, um, Bishop Samuel Will Beforce, had that heated discussion with P. H. Huxley biologist and supporter of, uh, of Darwin. And Huxley became known as, you know, who, was, who was a, 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 a first-rate biologist in his own right, and the grandfather of novelist Ald Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World. But T.H. Huxley became known as Darwin's bulldog because he defended, he defended Darwin's theory so tenaciously against, against the fundamentals. So it's nice to see Darwin had a lot of support. You know, uh, you know, in the in the in the UK and, and elsewhere amongst educated people, and even in the United States, yeah. by the way, the yeah. ed educated people accepted evolution. It was the Bible Belt fundamentalists who who uh, rejected it generally. But we, we we can get to that point. Yeah, you know, he he did have a lot of supporters, and that thankfully helped him avert one of these what would have been one of these great uh, great crises of, of scientific credit. Uh, June 18th, 1958, Alfred Russell Wallace sent Darwin a, a paper. He said, hey, what do you think of this? And he was proposing a very similar uh, theory of evolution. And Darwin, being the, the gentleman scientist that he was, he had already, he'd already written on this topic for years, but he had not published anything. He had written a, a small extract uh, as well as a 35-page paper on it and told his wife, you know, if I, if I suddenly die, please make sure this gets published. But you know, he was very interested in taking his time and really working out his theory. And all of a sudden this, this paper lands on his door. So uh, honorable guy though, he, he sent it to his friends in, 
the Linnaean Society, uh, named after Linnaeus, the uh, great cataloger of species. And the uh, members of the society, some of them knew that he'd been working on this theory for a while, and so they invited him to publish alongside uh, Wallace's paper some extracts from his, his pre-published uh, book, the, the book that he'd been working on already for several years and was planning on working for several more. And so Darwin kicks into high gear, and although he had planned to spend probably several more decades working on the origin of species or whatever it would have been called, uh, he publishes Origin of Species next year and basically says, this is the sketch. But really what it turned out to be is one of the most, uh, one of the landmark works in all of the history of science. And as we started by saying, you know, he set the stage and, and created this fundamental principle of, of the life sciences that now all life sciences are based on. So absolutely right. tremendous achievement. Right. And it's nice. It's great to see, you know, that there, there wasn't this bitter rivalry between Wallace and, and Darwin, because so often inventors, you know, I'm thinking Edison on the one hand and Westinghouse and Tesla on the other. Great movie on, on, on the recently, what was it, Current War? You know, on the, on the infamous war. war of the current. Yeah, the current war. Um, with, with Benedict Cumberbatch, who I always think of as Sherlock Holmes. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. As a great, great film, The Current War, strongly recommended. But anyhow, there's this, there's this, um, often this bitter enmity between, you know, geniuses who are, you know, with Leonardo and Michelangelo, the, the American founders. There's often this, this rivalry between scientists or, you know, intellectuals more broadly. Who has priority? I had that idea first, you know. Uh, and, but Wallace and, and Darwin were gentlemen about. I, I, I mean, they, they acknowledged each other. That we arrived at these theories independently, you know, and, and Darwin's was more fully developed. Right? But they arrived at, you know, at, at, these, at these theories independently. And it, it shows it's a template for what you, you, you said it nicely, gentlemen scientists. It's a, it's a template for gentlemen intellectuals, you know, uh, honest men can, can salute their uh, competitors, you know, or, or whatever, or other, th other thinkers who arrived at arrived at you know similar conclusions independently and say you know well done well done i you know i did this too my my theory is more you know more fully developed but i uh, i acknowledge the you know the, the the groundbreaking work that that you did it's nice you know it's nice to see that you know it shows us what human beings are capable of morally as well as intellectually yeah and more developed in several senses so we shouldn't uh give give wallace no credit but and I'm not super familiar with his work, but the primatologist Franz Amita, Duval. Amita. Yeah. So Franz Duval says of Wallace's work that he makes this distinction between Wallace and Darwin. He says that Wallace really thought that evolution stopped at the human head, that God, the God given divine spark that sets man apart from the animal is the human mind. So he, he thought that there wasn't this continuity between species, and Darwin thought, well, yeah, the continuity goes all the way through. You know, man is evolved from, from lower animals. The mind is the product of evolution as well. It's not this God-given God -given spark. Uh, it, it's, you know, it comes from nature. It's a, it's a natural occurrence. It's a, the product of evolution. So, you know, another important difference between Wallace and, and uh, Darwin that I think we should point out and keep in mind. Yeah. And, um, and I think, you know, we, uh, I'm a writer and a philosopher, you're a writer and editor and musician and technician and you're all around Renaissance guy, but neither of us are scientists, but we, we, we need to take a stab, however rudimentary, at, at what natural selection, you know, uh, actually means, what, 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 what the process is. Interesting, I, I don't think Darwin himself ever uses the term survival of the fittest. Right, I, I I believe that term was coined by Herbert Spencer, a contemporary uh, English philosopher, uh, sociologist who became infamous amongst the leftists for his you know his theory of social Darwinism. But um, I don't think Darwin ever uses the term survival of the fittest. But he he does talk about natural selection. I mean, they need to take it. So let me let me give it a attempt. I mean, my simple-minded way, what what little I know about biology. I I you know I'm a kid from Brooklyn. I need to, you know it needs to be 
illustrated for me. It needs to be, you know, uh, at the observational level for me to grok it, if, if I can use that great term from Robert Heinlein. But, um, you know, so, so I, I, here's an example I use in class when I'm discussing the, the biblical theory of human nature in contrast to the evolutionary theory. So we're on the plains of the Serengeti, let's say, you know, and here's the lionesses stalking through the, the tall grass. You know, they're hunting a, you know, an antelope, a herd of antelopes over here. And, uh, well, the lionesses, they can really run. You know, I, I, why do they just run after the antelope, grab one, kill it, and eat it? Why do they got to sneak up on it? <laughs> one of the students once said to me, because they're cats, they're too lazy, <laughs> which is very funny. <laughs> but, uh, no, a bit. But thank you for playing. That's not the right answer. As fast as the cats are, the antelopes are even faster, right? So well, what happened to all the slow antelopes? Well, over a period of millions of years, uh, you, you know, they got eaten by the lions, right, or other predators. So as I understand it, mutations occur all the time. You probably know more biology than I do, so correct me if I'm wrong. Mutations occur all the time. Mutation is a biological anomaly, right? It's, it's, it's a case where the offspring possess characteristics possessed by neither of the parents, right? Uh, and most of them are innocuous, have neither survival value nor disvalue. But once in a while, a mutation has survival value for the members of the species who inherit it, right, or possess it. And so somewhere along the line, let's say millions of years ago, this mutation occurs, which allows for greater foot speed amongst the antelope, whether it's fast twitch muscles or, or whatever it is. Uh, now, the, the antelopes that possess it, you know, with, with, what's the old say? You don't, have, you don't have, I don't have to outrun the bear, I only have to outrun you, <laughs> right? I mean, the antelopes that possess it are faster than the other end. And so they're, they're better equipped. They're, you know, they're more fit or more adapted to their environment to survive to the age of sexual maturity to be able to reproduce and pass on their genes. Whereas the slower footed antelopes are more likely to be caught by the lions and, you know, and, and, and eaten. And so over a period of millions of years, the, the weak, or in this case, the, the less fit or the slower antelopes are, are, are treated, you know, they're treated out and the herd, the herd gets faster. And the lions have to become more cunning hunters. But that's, in a simple-minded way, that's how I understand natural selection, that those, best, th those that possess the characteristics best suited for survival in their environment uh, will, will live long enough to, to reach the age of sexual maturity, uh, appropriate, and pass on their genes. I mean, th that's, that's my simple-minded version. What do, you do, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, from one uh, layman of science to, to another, I have to say, bro, bro maybe, maybe some of our listeners out there can and common and, and correct various aspects. Yeah, I think that's yeah. pretty spot on. Yeah, you're right. Maybe, maybe we probably, in our view, our viewers tend to be educated group, but probably some scientists out there who could put it in the chat or let us know, you know, if, if I'm essentially right or if I went off the rails here. And key, of course, like you said, to Darwin's theory is it applies to human beings, that this the human brain is an evolutionary development, right? Presumably at some point, in, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, in our descent from the ape kingdom, that some mutation occurs within, within the brain, whatever, you know, whatever it is that enables, whether it's, you know, more convolutions, more layers wrapped around the cortex or whatever it is that enables, you know, millions of more neurons firing, uh, giving rise to human intelligence. There's some mutation in the brain you know, that, that makes us vastly more intelligent than even the, you know, the apes and, uh, you know, who are intelligent animals. And the, and the, and the line of descent uh, splits off from the you know, more human beings, the more sophisticated uh, life form from, from, the, from the simpler primates. And, the, and I think it's, again, my simple-minded way, I, you know, think of the opposable thumb, you know, and the ability <laughs> to work with tools, you know, the ability to work with tools. Well, why didn't the lions develop? You know, like in, in, in my simple version, the lions don't have the brain power to, to, to you know, to study architecture, for example, and, and build homes or to study, you know, engineering and automotive engineering and invent automobiles and then repair them. They don't need to be able to work with tools. What are they going to do with, give them a set of, give a set of tools. There's a, hey, Mr. Lion, you know, hey, Leo, you know. Here's a saw, you know, and here's, here's a hammer and a chisel, you know, everything is a plane for, yeah, and happy birthday. You know, what's the lion going to do? He can't, he doesn't have the brain power to, you know, to, to need tools. But human beings, you know, we design shelters. 
take one example, going back to my favorite hero, Howard Rock, we need, and so we need to be able to build houses and, you know, and, and then shingle the roof and paint it and everything. We need to be able to work with tools. Our intelligence uh, you know, requires, uh, uh, the, enables us to, the way, the way we survive is by use of intelligence, you know, to make tools, work with tools, and also make weapons, you know, to you know, defend ourselves against dangerous beasts or marauding tribes or whatever. So uh, I think the, the opposable thumb uh, is, is a, to me, as I understand it, is, is a direct evolutionary uh, development because, because human intelligence enables us. Our survival requires the application of our intelligence, and that requires us to be able to work with tools. And so, you know, it, it has survival value. It has survival value for us, but that it wouldn't have of other species of animals. That's a why. Yeah, I think you know, the ape, apes and whatnot, and, and orangutans. They, they of course had the opposable thumbs first, and uh, and I think the the brain evolved uh, afterward. But yeah, you're right. He Darwin didn't. I don't believe use the phrase. Uh, survival of the fittest, his thought was that there's this transmutation of species that happens over millennia and huge differences can take place. And he just, he was fascinated by this idea of how many different variations had to have taken place between one species and the next. If you think about it, if we all evolved from, uh, you know, maybe a single living organism at some point, just how long would that take? How many different species, how many different forms of animal would have to to have lived for that to be possible for us to be possible think about just what went into to creating the human years and 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 just millennia of of evolution just mind-boggling but uh billions of is there roughly three billion billions, years sorry. right from the yeah, yeah three billion years yeah. i think from single cell you know, organisms but um but, yeah, let's go back to the opposable thumb Go back to the opposable thumb for a minute, because you're, you're right. The the apes have and everything, but is is it as highly developed as, and as flexible as the as as in the human being? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it is. It might be more highly developed to humans because of our need to work with tools, and and less so with with the apes because they don't have the the need to work with. They don't have the brain power to enable them to work with tools. Is is, is there is there is their thumb as highly developed as ours and and, and hands hands as flexible? I'm not I'm not sure. That's a good question for Franz Duval or another primatologist. But I think these two things probably developed and had to have developed synchronously. You know, the, uh, the hand develops with the brain as the, as the need comes. And those who are able to survive, as you pointed out, are those who are able to do the things that require hands, you know, uh, the ability to be dexterous and, and agile and to build the shelters, to build the tools, to fight, to fight off the dangerous species. That's... That's yeah. my understanding of it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're now okay. uh, in waters well, beyond me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Me too. We're not scientists. So we just, I you know, uh, apologize for my, um, whatever errors I might have made here in discussing natural selection. But uh, it's, it's yeah. in some form, of course, you know, we, we, we know that we know that Darwin, that Darwin's right, that the mutations that have survival value enable the members of the species who possess them to uh, you know, live to the age of sexual maturity, reproduce and pass on these, these life-giving characteristics. Uh, so this, I mean, this is a, a revolutionary theory. Like you said, it becomes the foundation of uh, uh, a biology in the 20th and 21st centuries. It's a foundational theory now, and, you know, and, and legitimately so. Should we, should we discuss the, the opposition uh, from religious fundamentalists and the, and the Scopes monkey trial briefly before we before we sign off, oh, I know what. John, yeah. One thing I wanted to say about let me say one thing before you go on. One thing about his personal life, <laughs> it really made me laugh. He made up a list because he marries uh, Emma Wedgwood, right? Keeping love in the family, the Darwin and the Wedgwood families obviously have an affinity. Cousin, which he marries his cousin. Yeah, he marries his cousin, Emma Emma Wedgwood, and um, he had to make up his mind whether he was going to get married or not get married. He made actually made up a list. Pro your reasons in favor of getting married, and con the reasons against getting married. And one of the reasons pro, you know, getting married was well, I have a companion for life. It's better than a dog. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. <laughs> better than, <laughs> no, Rosalie, you know, uh, Mrs. Hurst. Yeah. You know, better than having a dog sure, as man. a companion. 
Yeah, so I'm, well, I'm sure Emma Wedge would, you know, appreciate that that her husband, you know, regarded her more highly than a dog as a as a companion. But he married uh, his cousin, who, as you would expect, coming out of the Wedgwood family, was a highly intelligent, well educated woman who valued you know, who valued his work and uh, and took care of him because unfortunately Darwin had stomach problems, you know, and, and was ill through, through through most of his life. And again, obstacles are things to be overcome. Darwin overcame all these health problems to achieve at this high level and the, the death of their beloved daughter, Annie Darwin, at age 10, which you know, one of his biographers said is the reason why Darwin became an agnostic. So yeah, is he's already questioning uh, religious faith, but became an agnostic. You know, so he wasn't, you know, he, he, there was somebody who had studied to be a, a minister, you know, now, said, I don't know whether there, whether there even is a God. I mean, I, you can see why. Why would you, if, 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 if there's a God and God is all powerful and all good, why would you take my beautiful daughter, who's such a great person, she's such a great kid, why would you take her at age 10? Why would a benevolent God do that? You know, it's the problem of evil in the history, you know, of, uh, of philosophy. Why, you know, why, why these horrible things happen in a world created and governed by an all good, uh, all powerful God? It, it, one, according to one of his biographers, at least, is what makes him into a, an agnostic, you know, questioning God's very existence. Anyhow, he overcomes all of the, and other, other of their children died, and he, over, he overcomes a great deal of physical ailment and emotional pain in order to achieve at this enormously high level. So again, Shackleton's right. You know, obstacles are things to be overcome, and it's what heroes do. And his theory did as well, as you were alluding to, uh, was it 1925, the Scopes Monkey Trial? Yeah. In Tennessee? Right. Good right. old Tennessee? Yeah, well, you lived there, there though. I, lived, I, think, in the... I did, yeah. Uh -huh. I love Tennessee. Today, it's, it's very forward-looking. Nashville is one of the uh, best places in the country, in my opinion, one of the fastest developing re real estate markets, but uh, not so then. I don't think I would have loved to yeah, have lived in South Tennessee back in there. The South has the South has progressed enormously. I saw it my year at Clemson in South Carolina in, 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 regard, in regard to race relations, like, which is really an issue today. Um, but the race relations in South Carolina, in my experience, were much better than in, than in the North. I saw so many black and white friends, you know, out together and, and inter, interracial couples, you know, together. That, that the South's made a lot of uh, a, a lot of progress, uh, but uh, yeah, 1925. Um, this is during the era. The well, anyway, the 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 fundamentalists controlled the state legislature in a number of these Bible Belt states, and they they actually banned banned legally banned the teaching of evolution or evolution, as they might have called it. Actually, banned it in high you know public high school biology classes. I mean, it's just astonishing. In the land of the free, they banned this scientific theory from being taught in high school bio classes. I mean, it's just, it's staggering. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and you know, it, well, I mean, just to, to keep kids from learning actual science on the basis of what? A basis of faith that God created the world in seven days, apparently. But, uh, you know right. more about it than I do. Jump, jump in. Well, yeah, I was just br briefly, um, the American Civil Liberties Union, which at one time actually supported freedom of speech, uh, the, the ACLU uh, offered to put up the money uh, and pay for the lawyers to defend any high school teacher who, who, who would break that law. John Scopes, who was, uh, I, I, he, he was an athletic coach and a part-time teacher, reluctantly went along. Well, you know, part of this was interesting in the, in the actual history. Part of it was a publicity stunt by, by, by business and political leaders in, um, what town was it? Was it Dayton? Was it Dayton, Tennessee? Um, but anyway, anyway part, part of it was, uh, you know, a, a, a publicity stunt. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll become nationally known. The town will be on the, be on the map. It'll be, good. It'll be good for commerce. But anyhow, uh, so they put up the money. Scopes breaks the law. He's, you know, he's, he's John Scopes. He's brought up on trial. William Jennings Bryan 
prominent politician, right? Uh, Democrat who had been formerly Democratic candidate for the presidency uh, twice. Uh, he was a senator from, had been a U.S. senator from the state of Nebraska, was a fundamentalist, you know, famous, powerful politician, comes down to, to Tennessee to, to lead the um, um, uh, prosecution. And for the defense, they bring in Clarence Darrow, you know, the, maybe the greatest criminal defense attorney in the history of American jurisprudence, certainly one of prominent uh, defense attorney, uh, you know, who comes down to who, to head the head the defense, uh, and, and especially Darrow had supported uh, Brian in his presidential campaigns, and they would known each other. They were they, you know they, they they were friendly, but they're on opposite sides of this case. You know, William Jennings Bryan sees this as God under attack by you know religion under attack by these godless evolutionists. And Darrow sees this as a freedom of intellectual expression, freedom of speech issue. And the, 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 the trial rages on. The interesting thing about the trial is the judge won't let Darrow call his witnesses. He brings in all these great scientists to, to show how evolution is, uh, is uh, you know, a, a valid scientific theory. The judge, understandably, won't let him call his witnesses because <laughs> the law is not on trial here, <laughs> Mr. Darrow. You know, Scopes is on is on trial who clearly, who clearly broke the law. And so Darrow uh, resorts to the unprecedented move of calling to the witness stand as a defense, as a witness for the defense, the prosecuting attorney. He calls William Jennings Bryan to the witness stand and cross-examines him on, as an expert on the Bible. And, you know, gets the better of the exchange, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in this case. Now, of course, Scopes is convicted, as he would have to be. He, uh, he, he, he broke the law. And, but I think the judge imposes a fine of like a hundred dollars or, or some 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 tr trivial some trivial amount. But anyway, it's 1925. It's not until the 1960s, 40 years later, that the that the U.S. Supreme Court, SCOTUS, finally strikes down as unconstitutional. You know, these state laws banning the 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 teaching of uh, of evolution in the public high school. But the, the trial becomes a cause celeb. It becomes it was widely covered. You know, radio would just come in at that time. It's covered on the radio all over the country, around the world. Gives fundamentalism a big black eye. You know that, you know, that these ignoramuses are you know, squashing uh, scientific truth and the expression of scientific theories. And the trial is covered by none other than H. L. Mencken. Uh, you know, from the Baltimore Sun, and uh, you know, who's a famous famous journalist and, and, and a great cynic and, you know, and an arch enemy of, funda of fundamentalist religion. And, and anybody who's interested in the story, there's a great fictional work, Inherit the Wind, based, you know, it's not, it's not history. It's historical fiction, but it's a great play. The, the theme here is, you know, religion versus science or, you know, suppressive uh, theocracy, Versus, you know, in, independent thinkers. The theme is is brilliant, brilliant, and is, and and very much in you know you know in accordance with objectivist epistemology. The original movie made circa 1960 with Spencer Tracy uh, and uh, Frederick March is brilliant. It's absolutely absolutely brilliant, even better than the than the stage play. In in some ways, a strong strongly recommended. But. Um, it's embarrassing. There's a lot of things in, in history, like my good friend Eric Daniels, history professor, say, you know, history is messy. And, um, you know, in the United States, all of its greatness and land of the free, you see the suppression of black Americans, you know, you know slavery and Jim Crow. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. I don't agree with the leftists that America is a racist nation now, but it was in the past and brutally so. Uh, and trial. Uh, 1925. So, um, yeah, Darwin's theory has generated opposition from fundamentalists, as can be can be expected. The, the history of intellectual development is a is often is often a struggle, but I think the theory has certainly has certainly won. Uh, you know, and is well, I was going to say it was taught is taught in the high school biology classes now, but I'm not sure anything's taught in high school anymore, but for other reasons, not because the fundamentalists control the educational system, but because the leftists control the educational system. And that's another story for a, 
for another day, John, when we discuss education, maybe the great Maria Montessori. But the struggle of Darwin versus the fundamentalist is like, let me conclude with this. The struggle of Darwin versus the fundamentalist is like science versus religion round two. Round one was you know, Galileo versus the Inquisition. And his round two is Darwin versus the fundamentalist. So that, you know, that struggle, that struggle goes on. But in a free, if, 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 let's put it this way, if capitalism survives, if individual rights survives and freedom of speech and freedom of intellectual expression survives, then science will win out in this struggle against a faith-based beliefs because it's got the evidence to support it and faith-based beliefs do not. Well said, yeah, yep. So yeah, we, we're celebrating next Tuesday, September 15th, the day that Charles Darwin landed on the Galapagos Islands and a uh, huge turning point and, and very helpful for him in developing his theory of evolution, which uh, deserves all the, all the respect and admiration that we can give it. You know, uh, I'll repeat this one more time. Uh, Sedgwick, who was once his mentor, said of the theory that seems to shut the door on any view, however feeble, of the God of nature as manifested in his works. From first to the last, it is a dish of rank materialism cleverly cooked up and served up. So yeah, this definitely pissed off the creationists, rightly so, and uh, because it was just so such an indictment of this creationist myth. So we salute you, Charles Darwin. Thank you for your tremendous yes. achievement. Yes. Yes, we do. And I think in, in closing, we can, we can recur to uh, T.H. Huxley's response to Samuel Wilberforce. You know, and he acknowledged that Samuel Wilberforce, like his father, William, was a man of great intellectual gifts. But he said, he, but he said to Wilberforce something like, because this wasn't recorded, this was an impromptu discussion. But T.H. Huxley said something like, I would rather be descended from apes than, a, from human be than be a human being who uses his gifts to suppress or scientific truth or something something to that effect which is great you know a great quote from uh darwin's bulldog and i salute you know darwin and those who stood by him during you know during this dispute you know i could salute you say well done thank you and john i think 